The following is a presentation from Bethel Baptist Church and Pastor Al Fury. Let's take our hymn books, please. 325. 325. Jesus saves. Let's stand as we sing. 325. seated. Jesus. 
Bless the Lord. Wasn't that good? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. Get the ushers to come as we open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus saves. We thank you so much that we are saved. We're saved. We thank you so much. Heavenly Father, I pray as, as you met with us this morning, you'd meet with us once again. We need your touch, Lord. We need your presence. We need your guidance. We need to hear from you, and we thank you so much for that song, Jesus Saves. Lord, I pray that your, your hand of blessing would be upon the remainder of this night. Pray for the, uh, for the offering as well. Lord, that you would bless it here and abroad. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Horatio Spafford was a well-known lawyer and businessman in Chicago in the 1860s, where he lived with his wife Anna and their five children. He had invested heavily in real estate along the shores of Lake Michigan. He was a prosperous man and a devout Christian. However, in 1870, a series of events began to turn Horatio's world upside down. That year, Horatio and Anna's only son died of scarlet fever at the tender age of only four. A year later, while the Spaffords were still grieving the loss of their son, the Great Chicago Fire broke out and destroyed nearly every one of Horatio's investments. His entire life savings was gone. Aware of the toll these disasters had taken on his family, Horatio decided to take his wife and four daughters on a holiday to England, where they planned to accompany the famous evangelist D.L. Moody on his next crusade. However, just before they set sail, a last-minute business development forced Horatio to delay. Not wanting to ruin the family holiday, he persuaded his family to go on as planned and he would follow along later. With this decided, Horatio stayed in Chicago while Anna and the girls boarded the French steamship Ville du Havre to set sail for England. But several days later, Horatio received devastating news. The Ville du Havre had been struck by an iron sailing vessel from England. The ship sank in only 12 minutes, claiming the lives of 226 passengers. It was the worst disaster in naval history until the sinking of the HMS Titanic 40 years later. The next day, he received a telegraph from Anna from Wales. It read these six words, Survived alone, what should I do? The Spafford's four daughters were among those who perished. After hearing the 
the terrible news, Horatio boarded the next ship out of New York to join his bereaved wife. During his voyage, the captain of the ship called him to the bridge. A careful reckoning has been made, he said, and I believe we are now passing the very place where the Ville du Havre sank. And it was there, while staring into the watery grave of his beloved daughters, that Horatio penned the words to the great hymn, It is well with my soul. Last night I saw a picture come across on Twitter of a singer-songwriter. He was singing at a concert and a young man in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy wanted a picture with him so he took the picture and he put it on social media and he says, I have no problems. I think, boy, what a, what a perspective we, we get when we see others that go through tragedies. And if God is big enough to get Horatio Spafford through this tragedy and even write a hymn, he can get us through our problems as well. So let's sing that great old hymn this evening, It Is Well With My Soul, 375. Let's stand tonight as we sing, 375, It Is Well With My Soul.
Amen. Good singing. You may be seated.
383. My anchor holds number 383. On my tab. Bibles tonight, please turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 tonight. We're going to look at the life of that great deacon, Stephen. Acts chapter 6. After the service tonight, if you're a college student returning to college, we'd like to take you out for pizza. We've been doing that for years, and so I know not everybody's here tonight, but we'll catch them next week or something. But for those that are returning to college this week, we'd like to take you out for some pizza tonight and say goodbye to you. So join us after the service. And uh, we'll have a good time. Looks like my niece Paige came on a good night, didn't you, niece? <laughs> All right. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 tonight. We're just going to read a few verses, but we're actually going to look at both chapters. All right. Now, I'm not going to read all of chapter 7. It's over 50 verses. And, uh, but we're, we are going to glance at the beginning of it and the end of chapter 7. But we're going to look at Acts chapter 6, just the first few verses to start. And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business." But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. 
And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what we've heard tonight in worship, and we pray, Lord, that you were pleased. We don't want to waste our time singing songs and hymns that do not praise your name or glorify you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would receive them tonight as a form of worship. Help us, Lord, now to have our hearts tuned with thee. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God would help us to understand the word of God that's about to be shared. Lord, fill me. I need your help desperately. I humble myself before you. And speak to us tonight, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I must admit that of many of the characters of the Bible, Stephen is one of my favorites. We really don't have a whole lot on him. Acts chapter 6 and 7 are the extent of his ministry and life. The Bible doesn't say how long of time had passed, but it seems that in Acts chapter 6, we are in a very busy time of church history. The Bible says that the church was growing in a great way and there was a murmuring among the Grecians because of the, against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected. And with all that was going on, there was so much busyness and growth that they decided to call this group together and appoint some men that were not yet called deacons, but later on we find they would be. Men who were of an honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. They chose seven. And when they chose those seven in verse 5, the Bible says the pleasing the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and then it lists the other six, but no compliments attached to their name. Of these seven, it seems that Stephen stood out, and we will read those names in other parts of the Bible that, about these other men, and mostly just in greeting or in, in, in the conclusion of a book of the Bible, they will mention them being a part of some church, but... Stephen seems to stand out from the rest. I want you to notice some things tonight. I, I'm going to give you five points tonight, but I want you to just hold tight because the first three are just introduction. We'll go very quickly through them. I want you to focus on the last couple things. And so keep in mind that we are introducing here. And you say, why are you telling me this? Well, because I want you to understand I'm trying to build something here that, that would help us understand what happens at the end of his life. And if you will hold on and grasp on to what, what we are sharing with you from the Word of God, you'll, you'll know why things played out the way they did at the end of Stephen's life. I want you to notice, first of all, some characteristics about Stephen. We, we notice his characteristics. First of all, in chapter 6 and verse 5, there was an indwelling person. There was an indwelling person. The Bible says in the saying, please the whole multitude. And they told Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Simon was, or, or sorry, Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we often refer to the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost, or we are filled with it. But friends, he is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. We are filled with the person of the Holy Ghost. We have God dwelling in us. We have the power of God that is available to us because he has filled our lives. So there was an indwelling person, but we also see there was an infused power. The Bible says in verse 8, and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now make no mistake about it, you cannot separate the power from the person. Now I'm not talking about Stephen. He had the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, and because of that indwelling person, there was an infused power. God gave him power. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we talk about, we see that God says that he would give unto the church power. That power came in the form of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and it filled that place. And Peter stood up and preached the word of God, and 3,000 were saved. And so we have uh, this indwelling person, and we have this infused power. But we notice thirdly about his characteristics, there was an irresistible presence. The Bible says in verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake who are they the bible says in verse 9 then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the libertines the cyrenians and the alexandrians and of them of cilicia and of asia disputing with stephen how many of you know that as soon as you make a commitment to do something for god the devil's going to fight you 
I told you I don't know how much time has passed here, but the Bible talks about this time in verse 5 where they chose Stephen. and they, Verse 6, they set him before the apostles and they prayed over them, laid on their hands. And the Bible says in verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so many from the Jewish faith were coming and accepting Jesus as their Savior. And Stephen was doing miracles with great power. And then the Bible says, Then... As this thing began to roll, we learned what that word greatly meant this morning, didn't we? The Bible talks about God is greatly to be praised. It means an overabundance, and the the church was growing greatly. It was an overabundance. They were overflowing, if you will, and, and it caught the attention of these few sects of the Jews. And they came, and they began to dispute with Stephen. But they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. You see, God had done a work in his life and changed him to the point because there was an indwelling person, there was an effused power, but there was an irresistible presence. You know, sometimes we have this desire in our hearts and we make a decision in a service that I'm going to go win somebody to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell my neighbors. I was encouraged this week, and uh, you'll remember last Sunday morning we had some testimonies. The young people came up, and halfway through the testimonies, Denzel come up in tears. And, and I, I, I'm, I don't want to embarrass him. I'm not trying to embarrass him. Came up in tears and under a, a great conviction of the Holy Ghost, I believe, and said, I, I believe that, that God wants me to go tell my neighbors about Jesus, and I, I'm under conviction about that. And he said, well, isn't that wonderful? Your little boy got up and in tears told the church he wants to win people to Jesus. Let me tell you what happened next. On Thursday, he called Mr. Crevar and said, would you take me soul winning? Amen? Hey, listen, we, we need to put some feet to our prayers. There's a, a, a person dwelling within you called the Holy Ghost of God. And He will never leave you nor forsake you. And because of that indwelling person, we have this infused power in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 to go and tell the world about Jesus Christ. And, and when we do that, there's an irresistible presence. Listen, they cannot resist what you are speaking about. They may not like it, and they may not agree with you, and they may not accept Jesus Christ, but how can they argue with the power of God when it's real? So we see these characteristics about Stephen But no, right away, we notice a conspiracy. In verse 11, it says, Then they they didn't like what he was saying. and They couldn't argue with him. They couldn't resist it. They suborned suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemy. Blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this temple and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. Notice this conspiracy. First of all, they suborned men. It says in verse 11, the the Greek word there is hypobalo. We get the word hyperbole from it. Hyperbole is to exaggerate, to stretch the truth, and honestly, it's a lie. And so these men were suborned, the Bible says, to to commit perjury, to lie to this council. And so they suborned men, and, and, and it implies in the word that they were bribed to do so. They went around and paid some people to speak ill. The Bible says they suborned some men, and then they, verse 12, they stirred up the people. The Bible says in verse 12, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And then thirdly, we see they set up false witnesses. The Bible says in verse 13, And and they set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place. And, And so you'll see they suborned these men. They paid them to start salting their lies among the people. Of course, that stirred up the strife. Verse 12 says it stirred up the people. Those who are against the things of God will always try to disrupt the work of God. That makes me wonder this. Then are those who are disrupting the work of God against the things of God? He said, what do you mean? Well, sometimes we get into a, going in a church and we get excited about some things and all of a sudden somebody says, well, I just don't like what's going on. 
or I'm going to cause some unrelated problem, and I'm going to start gossiping, and I'm going to start trying. Listen, if you're disrupting the work of God, are you against the things of God? He said, oh, do you have any proof of that in Scripture? I sure do. Jesus said, I'm going down to Jerusalem to be betrayed in the hands of sinners. And Peter says, oh, be thou not so, Lord. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God. You see, Peter was trying to disrupt the things of God. Oh, I, I think I want to do what's best for Jesus, and I want to do what's best for the local church, and so I'm going to speak up, and I'm going to uh, spout off about what I think should be done. But listen, all you're doing is disrupting the work of God. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God. I looked at Acts chapter 6, and I thought, maybe this is a Baptist church here. They got people who are suborning others. They had people stirring up things, and they had set up some false witnesses. These false witnesses were ones who, once the ball got rolling, it just needed to keep momentum, so these false witnesses were complicit for free. They jumped on the bandwagon, and they began to promote these lies about this great man of God named Stephen. And they said, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. There was a conspiracy afoot. But I want you to notice in verse 15 his countenance. His countenance. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Let me see if I can illustrate tonight. Colton, would you come up here for a moment? Come on up. Run, 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 run. Now keep in mind what is going on. These Pull the chair out and just set it over here for me. The Bible says in Acts chapter 6, if you look back with me about these synagogues, of, there arose certain of the synagogue, verse 9 in chapter 6, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. All right, so over here. Drew's section. Raise your hand, Drew. Everybody in this section, you're the synagogue of the Libertines. All right? Over here in the center, in the, where the Ashbees are sitting, this will be the synagogue of the Cyrenians. And over here, we have the synagogue of the Alexandrians. All right? And over here, we have of Cilicia and of Asia. All right? Now, you have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat in the chair. Now, this council is called. Now, you say, why are you pointing out the different sections here tonight? Because the Bible says it was of the synagogues. It wasn't, this wasn't just some small, small council. This was five different churches, if you will. I call them churches, synagogues. Five different synagogues conspiring together against one man that was doing great works in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was doing miracles and power. I mean, it was on display. And God was blessing this man who was full of the faith and the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he was full of faith and power in verse 7. And the, and the Bible says he was just doing some great things in verse 10. Miracles. And then after that, immediately... The Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those of Cilicia and Asia, they got all upset. And as all good church groups do, they have a council. And they decide what God really thinks. And so all five of them got together. And I don't know how many were, there were, the Bible doesn't say. But they all started pointing the finger at this one man. Then they realized, we're not getting him off his game at all. I mean, he's consistent in his testimony. Things are going fine. So they said, here's what we need to do. We need to suborn some men. We need to suborn some men. And let's pay a couple people over here. Let's pay Drew, and let's pay Roger. And, and you start telling lies about him. Well, I don't really want to. I mean, come on. No, no, no. We'll pay you really well. Let's, let's pool our money together. We'll send a couple. And over here, let's, let's get a couple over here, and we'll, we'll pay you guys. And you start telling some lies. And this church over here, you take an offering. Boy, isn't that a wonderful way to have a missions offering? Isn't there a better use of God's money than suborning evil to have a man killed? But that's what they were doing. Understand what's going on here. Somehow they came up with some money, whether they took an offering, passed the hat. I don't know how they did it. They went into the coffers and took God's money. I don't know what they did, but they got a couple people and they said, let's, let's start telling lies. And so over here, Caesar starts telling lies to Ashley, and Ashley says, oh, really? And how many of you know that bad news travels way faster than good news? Huh? We call that gossip. And it doesn't take long when you got a couple people telling a lie, especially if they're trusted people and pillars in these synagogues, and they start... The next thing you know, everybody's upset. 
The Bible says they suborned some men who went out and they stirred up the others. Isn't that what it says? And then, of those that they stirred up, Caesar would say to Rob Ternowski, he'd say, now, would you be willing to testify at the council of what's... Well, Rob, I didn't really see it. I mean, I, I heard what you said. Well, don't you believe me? I mean, is not my testimony good enough? No, have I ever lied to you before? Well, no, I guess. Well, listen, this, this Stevens is... He's going to destroy... How many of our priests have been saved by the name of Jesus, and now they're Christians and they're following this new sect of believers, this, this Nazarene who died. Do you want our, our whole way of life to know? I don't want, no, I don't want that. Well, then you're going to have to come and testify. We need, we need numbers. And they set up false witnesses. And so they gathered this council together, it says. I believe it's in verse 15. And all that were in the council, every one he is, looked at him, and his face shone like an angel. Is that what the Bible says? No, I missed the word on purpose. And all that sat in the council looking, what's that next word? Steadfastly. They were staring. They were staring. Why do you stare at something? Have you ever been on the QEW and the traffic's moving so slow? And you know, oh my word, what, what? You know, and you're wondering why, why is this going so slow? And you get up there and what it is is somebody has bumped the guardrail over in the other side and so everybody just has to stop and look. That's all it is. There's nothing blocking your lane or flow of traffic and so you get up a little further and it just takes off. Once everybody's had their look, there's no fire trucks. There's no police. He's just pulled over. It could be just a flat tire and everybody in the world has to know what's going on. We stare at a tragedy. But we also stare at something magnificent. How many of you are planning on watching the eclipse tomorrow? Don't do it. Boy, I heard this. This is interesting. It was a good illustration. This has nothing to do with my sermon. You can just have it. Do you know that the sun is no more dangerous tomorrow than it is any other day of the year? You go and stare at the sun today, you'll, you'll be blind too. You'll do damage if you stare directly into the sun for any length of time. It just on a, a full eclipse like that, it appears less dangerous and so people look. But the rays are all the same that are coming around the moon and they damage your eyes because you are deceived into thinking it's less dangerous. I heard a preacher today say, that's just like sin. Well, when it feels good or feels right, it seems less dangerous, but it's just as dangerous as it always is. Be careful. That had nothing to do with my sermon. But we get excited and we stare at a marvel like that. I enjoy watching the stars. I like, we got home the other night and uh, we had a going away party for Colton and Tanner we got invited to and Colton didn't show up. But we went anyway, and we had a good time. And uh, we thought he left already without us. And when I come home, I said, I got out of the car, and I, don't, I remember, I said, look at all the stars tonight. I noticed that. I can pick out where the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper are, and I've just that interests me. I like seeing that. And I can sit outside, and I can stare at that. When I, if I get a chance, I'd love to be able to just stare at that. I remember as a boy visiting out in Winnipeg at, at the White Side's house and laying out in the backyard, and it was so clear out west, you could see satellites going across, and i just stare all night. Just stare. That's, that's what this word steadfastly means. They were looking steadfastly. Why? Because they were amazed. something was different about him. Something stood out. His face, who was staring? Every last one he is. It says all of them were looking steadfastly. And look what the Bible says. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, this was not some way to illustrate. I believe that through their history and through their writings and through the, the Scripture... They'd had some encounters with angels over the years. Read your Bible. Abraham on the plains of Mamre ran into an angel, the pre-incarnate Son of God. 
Jacob, the Bible says, wrestled with an angel till the break of day, and he said uh, he wouldn't let go until he would bless him. There was encounters with angels throughout the Old Testament. There were some shepherds on the hillside one night when the, 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 the skies burst open ablaze with angels, and so there were stories throughout history of angels. Sometimes we will say something. I've always wondered why. And ladies, I'm going to let you off the hook on this one. It's always men. It's always men. How many of you know a man that when he gets a sore back, he'll say, it's like somebody shoved a knife right here. And I always think, how do you know what a knife feels like? How, how can you make that comparison? It's always men, isn't it, ladies? Ladies can give birth to a 12-pound baby, and they'll say, yeah, it wasn't that bad. But men, oh, it's like somebody stuck a knife in and they turned it. And I'm thinking, how do you know that? Has that actually happened to you? Am I right, ladies? How many of you have heard that? Yeah? I don't think that's what this was. Because all these observers agreed together. That's an angel. There's something different. His face shines. You may be seated. I just want you to notice his countenance. But I want you to notice, I told you the first three were introduction. Let me give you the last two quickly. Turn to chapter 7 and verse 1. I want you to notice fourthly the counsel. The counsel. Now we've introduced the counsel. It's you. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? So the council has made their accusations. In verse 11, they said, we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred up others and they brought them to this council. In verse 13, these false witnesses said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. I don't know why they care about that. They thought Jesus was dead. <laughs> Somebody knew he was alive, didn't they? For they're still blaming him for all their problems, and they said that he would come and destroy this temple. In chapter 7, the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come unto the land which I shall show thee. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein he now dwelt. I want you to notice something about this council. When Stephen was present at the council, he was not interested in preserving self. Are these things so? Well, let me tell you my side of the story. Let me tell you what I really preached. No, no. He started preaching Jesus, starting all the way back with Abraham. He wasn't wor worried about promoting or preserving self, and he, he was not interested in promoting Stephen. He was interested in presenting the Savior. You say, why is that important? You remember what I told you about the foundation at the beginning? What were his characteristics? He was indwelt with a person. He was infused with a power. He had the Holy Spirit of God living within him. And God was using him to do some miraculous things. And now he's brought into this terrible place where all of you people are accusing him of something. And he sits there right in the front of the council and he smiles and his face shines like an angel. I don't know about you, but I almost start crying when I get pulled over for a speeding ticket. How many, how many of you get, does your heart ever flutter when you see the lights behind you? Even if they're not for you, they're just going around you and somewhere else to an emergency. Does your heart flutter? How many of you get scared even if the lights aren't on and you look in your review mirror and you see a police car and all of a sudden you're like, 10 and 2, 10 and 2. You slow right down. And the cop's thinking, why is he going 30 kilometers an hour in an 80 zone? Oh, we, 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 our hearts begin to flutter. Stephen was facing death. All you people are staring at him and throwing accusations at him. And if, if history is, is telling us anything, these people were an angry mob. And he sat there, smiled like the face of an angel. 
You say, why? Because he had the presence of God in his life. He had the power of God in his life. The Holy Spirit of God had brought a real peace. And when it came time, finally, he didn't say a word. They were arguing with him. They were fighting with him. They were accusing him of stuff. And he just sat there and smiled. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen's short answer for the next 50 verses is, let me tell you about my Jesus. I'm not interested in preserving myself. I'm not interested in promoting Stephen. Let me tell you about my Savior. And for the next 50 verses or so, he goes on to tell them about Jesus. The Bible says in verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened years, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it? Look at verse 4. 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Not only do we notice his countenance back in chapter 6 and the very last verse, verse 15, but we notice the Christ. We notice the Christ. Now, I might have said, notice the conviction. In verse 54, the Bible says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were under conviction. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They bit him. I might have said, notice the connection. Look at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in the right hand of God. I might have said, notice the connection, how he's filled with the Holy Ghost and now he's, he's got God on his side. God is not just in him, but God is for him. I might have said, notice the crying in verse 57. The Bible says, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. I might have said, notice the casting in verse 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. I might have said, notice the calling in verse 59, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I might have said, notice the compassion in verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. I might have said all those things. But none of those things are possible without the Christ. So notice the Christ. Go back to our foundation. Notice the characteristics of Stephen. He was indwelt with a person. The Bible says he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He was infused with a the power. There was an irresistible presence in his life, the presence of God's Holy Ghost. Then the world conspired against him as these five different synagogues got together and they suborned some men. They paid them off to lie about him and it, it stirred up strife in their assemblies and from there they were able to uh, set themselves against him. But through it all, because of the Holy Spirit of God, he sat before them with a smile and his countenance shone like the face of an angel. And when he opened his mouth, he wasn't worried about Stephen. He wanted to present his Savior. And from the day that Abraham came on the scene, right through the entire Bible, boy, he knew the Bible. He preached the coming of the just one, whom they betrayed and murdered. But finally, when they were cut to the heart and they were angry and they gnashed on him and they dragged him out of the city and they began to throw the stones. He looked up into the heavens and look at what verse 56 says. Behold, I see the heaven opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Jesus was cheering him on. He was guiding him home. You say, well, what does this mean to me, the common man? The guy that gets up tomorrow with my lunchbox and goes off to work. I'm the lady that's homeschooling my children and I'm, 
I've got a job and I've got a house to take care of and I, I, you know, I'm juggling all these things. The Bible says offenses must come. There's real trials in our lives. It only takes a phone call to change your life drastically. A bad visit to the doctor, a death in the family, a financial collapse, losing your job. Are you going to be able to sit like Stephen? When the world looks at you, when all these eyes are gazing upon you, you say, listen, you don't get here until you've first been in the presence of God. Until you're filled with the Holy Ghost and faith. Until you're trusting in Him. The Bible says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Hey, you don't get there unless you're filled with the Holy Ghost of God. When Stephen was was being pelted with stones, never once do we hear him cry out. The Bible doesn't record even once where he went, Ouch! Or it's not fair! He didn't see God open up the heavens and Jesus standing there saying, What's going on? I'm, I'm one of your best servants. No. Instead, he had compassion. He says, Father, lay not this to their charge. And as he looked up into heaven, boy, that really must have, boy, that, that would really bug him, wouldn't it? All you people are throwing stones at him, and he says, I see Jesus. Woohoo! Bring it on! I'm going home! But hey, you don't get there. You don't get that experience unless you're filled with the Holy Ghost. I have, over the years, sat by many bedsides of people that are dying. Been there when they've passed. And I want to tell you this. Some people die very well. Just very peacefully slip away. Jerry Claver just slipped away. Mary Dorson just slipped away. Others, scared to death and fighting with every ounce of their being. Petrified. And I have to wonder, they weren't practicing the Word of God like Stephen did. They're so fearful of what lies ahead and they they don't have that peace and they don't have that presence of God in their life. Listen, you have to have it your whole life if you want it at the end. It's not just a switch you can flip on and off. You need the presence of God. And what a difference He'll make. And there's going to be days. Boy, I'm telling you what, this world is falling apart fast, isn't it? What a mess. And there's going to be days where you get questioned. And people are going to mock you. Well, when I was a child, they had the theory of evolution. You know, it's not a theory anymore. I never even thought it was a theory, but boy, they mock and scorn if you believe in creation. This, this ark that's been built, boy, they just mock him and laugh at him all the time. Read the news. He's in the news all the time. They hate that guy. And they tell him he's so foolish and stupid. Oh, there's coming a day you'll stand before a council. It may not be a council of angry people that are seeing their religion slip away from them, but it'll be the world. It might be some co-workers that have some questions for you and mock you and scorn you. Have you spent enough time with God right now that you can say, you know, I'm ready for it. Stephen was ready. And when it came time for him to face that persecution, he was ready. But it was a lifelong thing. Can I say this? They didn't, they didn't lay hands on him as a deacon and he suddenly got the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, Choose you out from among you men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. He already had the Holy Ghost. He was already filled. And boy, God gave him a peace and a power in his life. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this evening. Let me ask you, do you have it? Pretty simple question. Do you have it? Do you have that peace and that power of God? Listen, that day is coming for all of us if the Lord tarries is coming. I'm not trying to scare you tonight. I want to prepare you. Boy, I, I want to face it with dignity. I, I, if that day of persecution comes, I, I don't want to be the one that lays down scared. Maybe fall on my knees. Turn to God. 
But boy, I want, to, I want to be like Stephen. I want to see the heavens open and the Son of God standing up for me. The Bible says that when he went to heaven, he led captivity captive. The Bible says he ascended up unto heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Boy, he must have loved Stephen to stand up. I want to have that kind of relationship with God. Would you stand with me tonight? Let's just stand tonight. The altars are open even now. Can you honestly say, I've got that kind of relationship with God. I'm, I'm, I'm right where I ought to be, and I'm, I'm living for God, and God's Holy Spirit is filling me on a daily basis, and I'm walking in faith and wisdom. Because you're going to need it one day. Maybe there's some here tonight just need to come and pray. Pray where you are, whatever you need to do, but do business with God tonight. Say, I want a, I want a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't want just life. I want abundant life. I want a spirit-filled life. I want to live for God. Brother Baker's going to sing a hymn of that, a verse of that hymn. If God has spoken in your heart, you step out and come even now. Be the me. still praying. Let's sing that chorus with Brother Baker. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. time. Um, also coming up on September the 3rd is a bus worker appreciation lunch. All right, so we're feeding you, and it's going to be great. Um, but just going over um, um, our insurance, our policies, as far as what we need to cover for our bus routes, um, and, and then also uh, preparing for our master club, um, uh, which is starting up on September the 10th. Uh, and so that'll be the Mass Club kickoff. And uh, so September 3rd is the bus worker meeting. September the 10th is going to be the, the first night of, um, of club. September the 7th is going to be a community barbecue. So if you want to invite people, your friends, your neighbors, uh, we'll be having uh, um, hot dogs and hamburgers after the morning service. Uh, we're going to be encouraging our kids to come out um, for that as well. And uh, I believe that's all that I can remember right now. So we'll pray and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much. Um, for your love for us. We thank you for the time that we got to spend together as a church family. 
uh, and, and be challenged from your word. God, I pray that we would um, take these lessons and these thoughts and, and uh, meditate on them this week, that you'd continue working through our devotions and our prayer time, uh, and just draw us closer to you, God. I pray that you'd bless us now this evening, give us safety on the roads, and I pray this in your name. Amen.